Oh, yeah, this is great. Quote, people said Pollock's work was not art. People said digital NFT art is not art. 21st century irony is alive and well. (laughs) We should just leave. Just leave it. Just leave it. Let's not comment. I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, the podcast where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest stories down to earth. This week, we're trying something different. It used to be that the art news slowed down in the summer months. These days, it seems like the art news never takes a break. With so much going on, we thought that instead of interviewing just one person for the podcast, we'd have three of our writer-editors get together and chat about some of the stories that have been in the air in July. So this week, we're going to talk about the big news that Freeze, the big international art fair chain, has acquired the Armory Show, New York's flagship fair, and Expo Chicago. We're going to talk about a Jackson Pollock-themed NFT that raised about half a million dollars this last week and the state of crypto art in general. And then we're going to talk about how artists in the past have dealt with Barbie as an inspiration and which side the art world is taking in the big Barbie versus Oppenheimer face-off. Without further ado, I'm joined by Artnet Europe editor Kate Brown to talk. Hi, Ben. Nice to see you. And also here with me is Artnet market editor Tim Schneider. Hey, Ben. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm in a small closet in Gloucester, Massachusetts, the town where they filmed A Perfect Storm. Uh, I was visiting friends this weekend, and so uh, I'm a little more relaxed than usual, but also a little more sunburned than usual. So it all nets out, and we should be on track to have a good conversation. Tim, we were going to start with talking about this quintessential piece of art business news about the different art fair chains buying each other, snapping each other up. Can you explain this story to me, why it's a big deal, why people care about this? Sure. And I'll try not to go too far down the rabbit hole with this because we could get turned around in all kinds of little business details that most of our listeners probably don't care about. The big picture news is that Freeze, which as I'm sure everyone knows, is one of the top two art fairs in the world. They're owned by this entertainment conglomerate named Endeavor. Freeze announced on Thursday, July 13th, that it had acquired the Armory Show, the longtime New York fair, and that it was going to finalize a deal to acquire Expo Chicago, which is a long-running regional fair in Chicago, obviously. That latter deal was going to close later on this year. Both The Armory Show and Expo are, at this point, supposed to continue operating under their own names and their own management, and they're supposed to stay at their current slots in the annual calendar. Expo is in April. Armory is in early September, though Freeze's CEO did tantalizingly say to Melanie Gerlis at Financial Times, shout out Melanie, that, and I quote, putting a little distance between Freeze Soul, which is in September, and Armory, could be, this is a quote, logistically useful down the line. So stay tuned for that. The reason that this is a big deal is that it speaks to this larger issue of consolidation that we've been seeing in the business side of the art world for a long time now, whether it's larger galleries, taking on people who used to run their own galleries and just sort of making them directors, or whether it's art fairs that are large, buying art fairs that are smaller, or whatever else. It's just this big roll-up thing that we see happening, not just in the art business, but in business overall. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that we could go with this, but I'm going to stop there because I feel like I've already been talking for too long. So, Kate, you go to a lot of art fairs. Ben, you go to plenty of art fairs. Like, did anything strike you about this news when it first came over the, the transom? I read it like as a bit of a chess game move between Freeze and Art Basel because in May 2021, I think it was, Freeze announced that it was going to move to Seoul. And that was sort of when ABHK, Art Basel Hong Kong, was feeling a bit uncertain in its future because of the ongoing lockdowns in Hong Kong and also in China. And then that fall, Art Basel made a bid behind closed doors for the Grand Palais, which is where FIAC is, and they actually won. And so then it was announced that like they were going to move into Paris. And so it's interesting because there's been this kind of back and forth between these two fairs with this sort of rapid expansion. 
And this news about Freeze expanding in the U.S. comes, you know, after this announcement about Paris and the first edition of Paris Plus, which was very successful from reports. And also was kind of a moment where people were sort of diagnosing the London market as like dead or dying. And I would ask you, Tim, like, how much of a threat do you think this is potentially to the power of Art Basel and Art Basel Miami Beach and the American art fair market in particular? I think that it's sort of a different magnitude than the fairs you're talking about, because this isn't a matter of Freeze going out and saying, we are going to start brand new fairs from scratch in countries where we didn't previously have a presence. So we're in the situation where Freeze now runs seven fairs. Four of them are in the U.S., and that's a different strategy than the closest precedent that I know of in this sector, which is that there was this run for about a year and a half where MCH Group, Art Basel's parent company, bought stakes in a series of regional fairs, including Art Dusseldorf, the India Art Fair, Masterpiece London, and then it was going to go off and start a fair called Art SG in Singapore. The thing is that all of those investments were different fairs in different countries. And there's a whole sidebar we could do about what happened with those investments. Long story short, MCH Group basically got out of all of them in one way or another over the course of the next several months. But for me, the difference here is that Freeze isn't saying, okay, we need to try to put a flag down in as many different countries as we can around the world. They're instead saying, let's just focus on what is, by the data that we have anyway, the most robust art market in the world, meaning the US. Let's just really double down there and try to connect kind of a year long network of events throughout there and put roots down in cities in the US that we didn't have before and really try to, I don't know, make a stand in a way where now, like the MCH group, meaning Art Basel has one fair in the US and Freeze has four. So it kind of tilts the balance of power. I don't know, it's hard to know what to say about this. But the thing is that really stands out to me is that it really is doubling down. They've already got a fair in New York. That's what I don't totally understand. I don't understand the calculation. New York is a very a robust art market, I hear, but they already have a way to play that game. And there has been this kind of long-term consolidation around art fairs. There has also been a lot of art fair fatigue. It's just the idea of sustaining big must-go-to events all over the world has already been, as far as I can tell, fraying at the edges. I guess I should say, do you guys think that's true, that there's art fair fatigue? Am I just speaking from myself as a critic who is very tired of having to cover these things? Yeah, I mean, I definitely have a bit of fair fatigue for sure. I don't know. I think we'll have to wait and see with this one. But it seems to me that there's a bit of a guesswork that like a rising tide floats all boats, you know, like bringing the profile of art fairs higher, trying to get more collectors on the Rolodex, like might be beneficial to them all. There might be some strategy there in terms of this expansion in the States. I guess I just think that from where I sit and again, you market experts can tell me if this is not the case, but I feel like wealth is very mobile and not particularly rooted to place anymore. And that New York art fair and definitely Chicago art fair have been in long term sort of decline against the specter of Art Basel Miami Beach. It's a nicer experience to go to Miami and there's all this momentum around the Miami fairs in terms of like the kind of fashion and party side of this equation. So to me, it's like, I don't know what they get by having two fairs in New York. I genuinely don't. It perplexes me. Yeah, I was also going to ask what you guys thought about the fact that the fairs are keeping their brands, because this also sort of surprised me. I don't know. I really noticed in the initial coverage of it, everyone kept using the same word, which makes me wonder if it was a talking point. They kept saying, these fairs have deep roots in their communities. First off, <laughs> given the fact the corporate megalith that is sitting on top of Freeze, I'm sure that that was a talking point. I don't think that everybody spontaneously came to that and the announcement of a major deal. 
I'm going to preface this by saying I don't know how much it actually matters to the art communities in Chicago and in New York. But if you recall, I mean, Kate, you were on top of this from the beginning. But when Art Basel announced it was going to do Paris Plus, there was this whole thing about how they were really trying to make Art Basel secondary to the idea that it was in Paris. Like the fact that they didn't just call it Art Basel Paris was itself a concession that they were making because they didn't want it to be like they were some imperialist organization parading into a city where they didn't previously have a presence and saying like, oh, now we own this place during this week on the year. Now, my impression is that that probably matters more to people in Paris than it does to people in (laughs) Chicago. They're notoriously (laughs) fickle. But that being said, I also understand that it is kind of delicate and you don't want to go in and just sort of say okay, this is now Freeze Chicago. And also, and just weird in New York, because, like, what are you going to do? We're now Freeze New York Part 2, like, the, the Return of the Jedi? Like, I don't know. It's, it doesn't even make any sense from a branding standpoint. Exactly, though. I mean, I think that entire move, you know, reflects the kind of sense that there's this just continuous moving banquet of art fairs that are all kind of samey. I mean, it's the same format everywhere you go in the world with like local variations. So yeah, I think they must be emphasizing community and, you know, the great deep city roots of these things. They're going to keep their branding partly because like, what's the difference? Otherwise, like, why do one, not the other? I mean, I know that there are seasonal reasons and to a certain extent, a lot of business is done at these things. So the more, the better, but also, I mean, Again, I feel like the art fair moment has kind of passed, which maybe this consolidation reflects. There was a moment when it seemed like art fairs were very dominant. And then it seems like more recently, there's like a whole conversation around, actually, this model doesn't work, not even for the fairs. Like this is actually a much lower margin business than people thought before. That's my impression. Is that right? I think there's a lot of truth in that for sure. The one thing that I will say about this, and this is not necessarily my perspective, but it is something that I have heard people talking about since this deal or these deals were announced, which is that there is an argument that this is a response actually to the fatigue problem in the sense that one of the big questions anytime there's one of these major fairs anywhere is which country's collectors actually showed up for this thing. And there is an argument that American collectors have been less present at some of the major fairs Mm. internationally lately, and that Freeze could be doing this as a way to say, listen, you don't have to go to all these other places. We can create a series of events here in the U.S. where you will never actually have to show your passport to be able to go see things on a consistent basis at a certain level of quality throughout the year. Now, that to me seems a little short-sighted just because I think the adventure, the excitement of going to these places is such a big driver of why art fairs became a thing in the first place. So it doesn't totally make sense to me, but there are people out there making that argument. It is something worth paying attention to, but... For me, it just, I think, largely overlooks the social dynamic that makes so much of the art world go at the end of the day. Yeah, it's a head scratcher to me, for sure. And speaking of things that are head scratching, maybe that's our cue to to move on to the story I wanted to talk about, which was the state of the NFT scene. In some ways, I kind of feel like art fairs kind of function like social networks and rose in the age of social media and then hit the point of fatigue about the same time that social media (laughs) happened. Like there was these kind of two parallel developments that both had to do with crowding together a lot of information and network effects and stuff. And then at a certain point, there was a parallel conversation about how there's a real dark side to this or there's a lot of overload to this. In any case, NFT moment, NFTs still around, not as hot as they used to be. The big story this last week was the sale of a addition to NFT from Jackson Pollock's studio, which was a collection of four images of the floor of Jackson Pollock's studio that were sold 
as NFTs, but also, I think importantly, with a high-resolution photo. So you actually got a physical work of art. And this edition sold for about half a million dollars. There was some excitement around this. Is this a sign of the NFT market coming back? What do you guys think? Does this story make you look again at what's going on in the NFT world? I'll say this. It has struck me that despite all of the doom and gloom, much of it justifiable about the state of crypto and the NFT market, it does seem like something we need to continue to pay attention to because this stuff just kind of keeps happening. Now, I think we could have a big discussion about what exactly these sales signify and how much of a real audience there is behind them because I think as all of us know, there has always been this phenomenon within crypto trading of wash sales and people sort of pumping their own product in one way or another. And I'm by no means accusing anybody who's involved in the Jackson Pollock NFT sale of doing that. But there is always this question of just because something sold, what does it really indicate about the real level of demand out there? in the world. And unless you're going to do forensic blockchain analysis on this, which personally, I haven't had a chance to do this weekend. I'm going to guess nobody else on this call right now has either. If I'm wrong, please, by all means, speak up now. No, I, I thought about it, but then I went to the beach. <laughs> I was um, thinking about how it's becoming more clear that there's really like, and I'm speaking as a person who's not overly invested or haven't done so much research about NFTs at all in my writing or my editing, but I did edit this Jackson Pollock story. And it's becoming more clear to me that there are very two distinct strands in the NFT like art yeah. game. There's like NFT artworks and then there's NFT like merchandise kind of. And at the beginning when all of this like popped off, I think that I personally, and I feel like it was probably shared by many people, I couldn't tell the difference. It was sort of a confusing muddled time of trying to figure out like what was art and what was just like a fun trading item. And I guess I really felt even with this Jackson Pollock thing that it was very clearly to me, like it reminded me of like a porcelain that has like a Gustav Klimt printed on it that you can buy at the museum shop. Like it's a nice thing, but it is still right. derivative merch. And I just was kind of relieved. And I was like, oh, it's like clear now. We're not even trying to like story tell this in any other way. I don't know if you guys agree. Oh, that's a good point. No, I hadn't thought about it like that, but that is true. And maybe something that's kind of honorable actually about this particular sale is that it was framed that way. I mean, I'm not that impressed by it. It's $1,500 a print and you got a physical print. People talk about it as an NFT sale, but you could have just reversed the story and said like people paid $1,500 for a really nice photo. And as a nice bonus, they get an NFT of it. I hadn't thought about it that way, Kate. That's interesting. Yeah, this is more fully like homing in on the idea of this as uh, kind of merch, uh, some form of digital gift shop item, essentially. The really interesting thing, I guess, in the bigger NFT conversation is that I do think in this NFT great freeze we're in, it's like the NFT winter, but it's the great winter from the Game of Thrones. The moment that you're talking about where there's this frenzy where JPEGs of rocks were selling for big amounts of money and art people were like, what the heck is this? That's over. But this weird thing happened that it flipped where right as things crashed was about the moment the art world got its, into gear to be like, no, we can work with this. There's like a whole history here. There's conceptual art. You know, there's like the Hans Hacke resale royalties contract. This all makes a lot of sense to us. And that's exactly the moment people got their acts together to enter the conversation. So in a way, there have been all these fine art NFTs that have been actual kind of art news outside of the weird semi-art news of the NFT world in the last year as people tried to explore the space, which I've heard people argue two ways, that there's the way I just argued, and then I think there's also a secondary way that in the moment where there wasn't this pure speculative frenzy of a market around NFTs to talk about, NFT people discover the value of institutions, you know, <laughs> and look to art institutions to do exactly what art institutions are supposed to do, which is provide some kind of independent measure of value outside of the marketplace and focus attention. So you had this like rush of donations of NFTs to big museums like the Pompidou and LACMA in the last year. 
the Jackson Pollock NFT, you know, they did prominently tout that NFT super collector Pranksy had bought an edition. And it's just very funny to hear the directors of the Jackson Pollock studio museum excited about the interest of Pranksy in Pollock. I will never forget there was a story a long time ago that I was writing. This was in the midst of the frenzy in 2021. And I was talking to somebody who I think at the time was an auction house executive. Been in touch with any number of times over the years about any number of different people or prominent one way or another. And I just remember them saying to me something to the effect of, yeah, and if you really are looking for a great collector source, like we can put you in touch with Whale Shark. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, what on earth are we doing here? Like, I'm actually genuinely interested in this space and what's going on, but there is just a certain dimension to it where it just feels hard to take seriously. Yeah, 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 sure. And I mean, the same week that this Jackson Pollock news broke, I was kind of pop of good news in the NFT scene where, you know, most of the podcasts or newsletters I subscribe to are pretty glum right about now. You know, there was this other story about Melania Trump selling an NFT that's like this really weird grift on a website called usamemorabilia.com. There's $75 digital collectibles that unlock a, a secret audio if you buy them. And it's like images of the moon landing. But then there's like this whole side controversy around it where this iconic image of Buzz Aldrin on the surface of the moon and, you know, NASA has explicitly said, we don't want our photos used for NFTs. So people are making fun of that. And if this was good news, Melania is right there to remind you of all the associations of this space with grift. First off, before I say what I was actually going to say, I also think it's important to just zero in more specifically on what these things look like, at least from the image that I saw. It is not just a photo of the moon landing. It is a photo of the moon landing or a series of photos of the moon landing that for some reason are depicted on what looks like a first generation iPod that has the texture of the surface of the moon on it. And a footprint. <laughs> and a footprint, yes. Thank you, Kate. Very important. <laughs> Very and I, important. And I, guess that plays into the whole notion of this secret audio message that you get to unlock if you buy one of these things, but also what? <laughs> I have to say, I like, I was like thinking about the two of them and which one I would buy. And not only because of the vastly different prices, I think like Melania's is $75 and the Pollock one, as you said, is 1500 but it's so weird that I think I would prefer to have that in my collection. Like, it's just... What? It's bizarre. In the same way that it feels like this weird kind of kitschy thing that you would find in a tourist shop. Just like it's so strange. And there's many ways that you can interpret it. And probably none of them would be right because it doesn't really make any sense. But like in that way, it almost circles back into being an actual artwork. Oh, that's okay, interesting. I guess I guess we have to finish this round of the segment by going around. Tim, Melania Trump, Moon, Memorabilia or Jackson Pollock? I think that this is personally and Kate, I, I fully respect and appreciate that take. But for me, as somebody used to go see a lot of really bad movies when I was in college, did anybody else here ever see Alien vs. Predator? No. The concept is right there in the name. It's the aliens from the Alien franchise against the Predator from the Predator franchise. And somehow humans get caught in the middle. <laughs> it's absurd. The reason I bring this up in this context is because the tagline from that movie is burned in my head forever. And the tagline is, whoever wins, we lose. And this just strikes me as a situation where if we're choosing between the Melania Trump moon landing NFT and the digital photo minted as an NFT of Jackson Pollock's floor, I don't know. I just kind of feel like there's no right answer. Oh, oh one more thing before we move on is that I wanted to say about the Jackson Pollock's floor, I did notice looking around at how this was covered in more NFT specific websites that they were emphasizing the AI aspect of it. You know, there's some nebulous AI aspect, like really low level, like these images were taken from different parts of the floor and then AI stitched them together. And I just thought it was a pretty telling because AI has pretty much sucked all the oxygen out of the room in the last year. And that even in this Jackson Pollock NFT, where you get this physical print, they're emphasizing whatever AI novelty 
It has. Oh, what was that quote, Tim, that you were mentioning from the Paula Krasner Foundation? Because this was quite funny. Okay. It's a quote from Helen Harrison, who's the director of the Jackson Pollock Studio. Oh, yeah, this is great. Quote, people said Pollock's work was not art. People said digital NFT art is not art. 21st century irony is alive and well. (laughs) We should just leave it. Just leave it. Just leave it. Let's not comment. I think it's perfect. To just leave that hanging in the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll let Will Harrison have the final verdict on the Jackson Pollock NFT. We've already started talking about Kate's weird taste. And so, Kate, <laughs> you wanted to talk about the work of Barbara Millicent Roberts. As everyone knows, that is the real name of the doll Barbie. A lot of chatter about the Barbie movie. We had an article about instances where artists have used Barbie as an inspiration. What did you want to say about Barbie? I feel like if you're talking about the news of the last few weeks, you can't even avoid it. I wasn't like particularly excited about Barbie mania, but nevertheless. It's all Barbie and Melania Trump NFTs for you, huh? (laughs) It's, you can't get away from it. Like not a day goes by where you don't see some strange aspect of guerrilla marketing for this movie. It's just incredible. And I am like of the generation that feels like particularly targeted by this as a millennial who was like raised in the 90s. Um, So just to like cycle back a bit, there was like all these headlines and some of them intersected with the art world and we covered them. There was like this controversy over this map in the movie that like depicts the South China Sea with this controversial like nine dash line. So like Vietnam banned the film. Then like this artist duo studio Drift deconstructed a Barbie doll and like made an artwork out of it. Stuart Semple made his own version of the color pink as like a commentary of Mattel's trademark of magenta pink. It's just been kind of like a wash in all of these stories. And then for me, I was more or less paying attention. But then when the memes culture started to really get into it and like pitted Oppenheimer, this new film by Christopher Nolan against Barbie, and suddenly it felt like there was this transcendent commentary happening about like our cultural moment, I actually became quite interested in this. And I have never done this before, but I went this weekend to see both of the films back to back, which was quite interesting because I was kind of wondering if there was like any substance behind this. You know, I I wondered if it was that the films aesthetically are just really juxtaposed or if there is actually some kind of juxtaposition in terms of their content as well. Because, of course, we all know that Barbie is supposed to be the sort of takedown of hypersexualized feminine culture. So I ended up sitting in seven hours of a movie this weekend. Two movies this weekend. I'm kind of curious what you guys make of Barbie Mania and Barbenheimer yourselves. In terms of just take things off with the art part, what I just think is funny is that the reference to Barbie is not only very common in art, it's like a cliche in art to the point where I think there's a Portlandia sketch some years ago where they have a store for shocking art supplies. And, you know, one of the art supplies they advertise to their potential art students is, you know, old doll parts. Barbie is like almost too obvious a symbol in art. It has been so encrusted with this kind of ideas about the critique of everything that Barbie represents that it's almost like if you were in an art crit with someone, you'd be like, a little obvious. Uh, We we need something something a little more nuanced. But I, I guess what I just think is funny is that there's all this kind of like takes on the movie about how unexpectedly feminist it is. And I'm just like, have you been paying attention to what Barbie's been doing the last five years? Because from the art world, what I remember is them releasing the Frida Kahlo Barbie, you know, (laughs) the the controversy over that. And that is part of a line of role model Barbies that include Amelia Earhart and Ava DuVernay and people like that. So from my point of view, it's like, yeah, what did you think the Barbie movie was going to be? It is essentially a cliche at this point as an object of feminist critique. The Barbie movie is going to incorporate feminism. Well, of course. And I think, you know, the question I sort of had was like, are they going to manage to critique it meaningfully? But in the end, of course, spoiler alert, you know, Mattel as a corporation is like in the movie sort of as this like slightly evil corporation that's being run by a character played by Will Ferrell, who's like Will Ferrell's playing the CEO. But in the end, it does this perfect thing of like smart branding where it captures its own critique really well. So like you can't really criticize it because they've already told you that they're evil, but then they sort of like wrap it up in a bow at the end in this very like smart way. So if you were going to the film being like, oh, you know, Barbie's so problematic and all the plastic 
like in all the waste and consumerism, you kind of leave feeling like they've like checked all the boxes with you and somehow you're like both in agreement again. And, you know, I went into both of the films kind of wondering if there was like any allegories with the art world. And I was thinking a lot about like virtue signaling that you have in museums, for example. So where you'll have like an exhibition that is a group show that is all about diversity, but then you'll have this like union busting board that is like all white men, you know, so it had this kind of irony packed into it that was really unsettling. Well, one thing that I'll say about the aesthetic or cultural impact of Barbie as somebody who was just walking around New York this past weekend, it was so immediately obvious who was either on their way to see Barbie or had just come from seeing Barbie because the level of borderline cosplay in terms of people wearing these just eyeball searing shades of pink and their most sort of prototypically feminized outfits and all these kinds of ways. It's the first time that I've seen that kind of participation level for anything that wasn't a comic book movie or Star Wars or Star Trek or something like that. And it created this kind of performative aspect of the movie that radiated into just everyday life, at least here, in a way that was unique to me. I did not see the counterpart of random assortment of extremely haunted looking men wearing fedoras who were on their way to see Oppenheimer. (laughs) So I'm not sure what that says about who won this particular bout. Obviously, Barbie demolished Oppenheimer at the box office, though both did extremely, extremely well. But I'll just leave it there. Well, awesome. I mean, the thing is, the Barbie cosplay is the thing I find most intriguing about the whole phenomenon. And also it sits sort of in an uneasy relationship with this stuff about the feminist critique of Barbie that has been part of the artistic conversation around Barbie for probably since Barbie's been around, just because of the nature of what Barbie is. But there is a way that, of course, the kind of let's dress up for the Barbie movie is ironic, but there's also a really sincere kind of like psychic investment in this aesthetic and the fun of it. I find that more interesting and reveals like layers about how people have like lived with this doll despite having an uneasy relationship to what it represents over a really long period of time. I find that more interesting than an installation that's like the Venus de Milo in form only filled with melted Barbie dolls. It really is a good example of where we're at in culture right now. We're like, we know that we're heading in the wrong direction. We can't do anything about it. So we might as well get dressed up and we're kind of self-aware, but we're still kind of just accepting it. And I feel like the Barbie film really like encapsulates that kind of energy really well. In a way, I just find that more human because I think that's how people actually live with stuff. You know, it's just like you're always in a compromised relationship with things, except at very high points of like critique where Mm -hmm. you're like, you have to live with a phenomenon, but you also are trying to figure out how you relate to it critically. And the mix is actually really interesting to me. I do think the thing that interests me culturally about the Barbenheimer phenomenon is what I want to say is that basically it's just one of these cultural phenomenon that weren't invented by a marketer, but probably could have been. And because the big thing that people can participate in by going to see some combination of these movies and taking a side or being part of it, it's this participatory spectacle of cultural consumption. But I don't think it would have become like a meme if the juxtaposition between the two didn't capture something. And I do think there is something, you were saying this just now, Kate, where the Barbie Oppenheimer juxtaposition captures this kind of oscillation between kind of like, I'm just going to party and I just want to like turn my brain off kind of vibe on one hand. And then the trap door you dropped into where the next second you're thinking, yeah, but the world is ending, you know, (laughs) things are really bad. We got to reckon with that. But that's what's so interesting about the Barbie film is that she has irrepressible thoughts about death. And that's kind of like where her hero's journey begins. So in a way, like both of the films are a lot more similar. They're both really about death, existential dread, like Barbie's having it for like her own reasons. And then Oppenheimer's having it for very distinct reasons. Humans have only one ending. Ideas live forever is like a quote from like the Barbie film. And then Oppenheimer has like, now I have become death, destroyer of worlds. 
there is this very macro anxiety that is in both of the films. They just obviously deal with it very differently in terms of aesthetics. Something that maybe connects all three of these headlines is fatigue. And I think that the film industry, I mean, I'm by far from an expert on the film industry, but they've been having this crisis of footfall in cinemas as well, right? So it is like serendipitously like this big event that is like bringing people out through this kind of counter programming of these two films. It's very similar in a way to what we were saying about the fair as you know, and whether like how competition in a way like brings more people to pay attention to it, right? As somebody who tries to pay as much attention as I can to the business of movies. I felt very seen this weekend in a way, because if you read any of the headlines about what the success of the Barbenheimer phenomenon means, there's all this soul searching and back and forth within Hollywood and observers of Hollywood about what does this actually mean for the business of movies? There's one side of it where people say, oh, actually, what the success of these two movies shows, especially in conversation with all of these middling to poor openings of sequels and franchises, whatever else, this is some kind of great corrective that proves that the audience will come out if you give them major new properties from respected filmmakers who are really cut loose to just realize their vision on screen. And then you have other people who will say, this is such a fluke that this happened, that you had these, as we've sort of been talking about, these two sort of diametrically opposed movies colliding at the same time. And their collision has created this largely online and social media driven phenomenon. Like the Barbenheimer thing is not something that the studios came up with. That was something that just rose up organically from people who were paying attention to this stuff. And basically every marketing executive in Hollywood would admit to you, if they were off the record, that like they couldn't have manufactured this if they tried. And so the question then ends up being, well, is this some great lesson or is this just some last gasp of a model that otherwise is completely on its way to collapsing? And those are the same kinds of conversations that I have to end up engaging with every time there's an auction cycle that does particularly well or particularly poorly. Or, Kate, you've had this phenomenon plenty of times when you go to art fairs, the first day sales, like what do they indicate about the state of the business? And it's really hard to actually unpack all that stuff. There are some times when it doesn't necessarily indicate anything about the macro state of the world, but it's just, it's sort of eerily familiar to me in a way to see some kind of business milestone in an adjacent cultural industry. And then seeing all this infighting about what the hell to make of it. And I'm just kind of like, I'm glad I don't have to come up with an answer to that this time. So maybe the answer to why does Freeze want both the Armory show and Freeze New York is, you know, maybe they're going to try and get together some kind of Barbenheimer Frankenstein buzz uh, going around that. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think that sort of kind of organic groundswell of online, you know, meme making and around these is kind of like mega franchise culture is the organic part of culture. <laughs> you know, that's what you're left with. If you lose all the indie movies, you're just left with people reacting in more or less uh, heartening and genuine and authentic ways to the things that they see. I don't know who said this. This is like some thing that's been passed around online, but I like the interpretation of Oppenheimer as being Chris Nolan's apology for helping create the modern superhero phenomenon with the Dark Knight. That the Dark Knight is his atom bomb, that he uh, is reckoning with the effects that it's had on the world. So on that bittersweet note, I think that wraps up our discussion for this week pretty nicely. Kate, it's been great to talk to you. Yeah, it's been fun. Thanks, Ben. And Tim, I think now maybe this is the time that we note that Tim Schneider, who is a voice that people will know on this show and is one of the founding producers of The Art Angle. This will probably be your last time on the podcast, Tim, because you are off to other adventures. Yeah. Talk about bittersweet. I mean, we had a good run here and really a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you both and to premiere this new format. And I hope that it serves everyone well in the future. You'll be missed, Tim. Yeah, for sure. And I can't wait to see what you do next. 
That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manolili, Caroline Goldstein, and Tim Schneider. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.